Hey, welcome to our service today. I welcome you here in Corpus Christi, and I welcome all of our brothers and sisters who are in this sanctuary. And we don't forget about those of you who are in Asia, Africa, Europe, here in North America, Central America, South America, Australia, and the islands of the sea. And uh, we're just so excited. We thank you. Uh, the scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. I love the scriptures. I love the Psalms. And I think that uh, they give us instructions as to how God wants to be worshipped. So I trust today that you will join us in worship and song. Uh, Brother James is going to be leading us with the team. And uh, I believe that God will do something special for you during the praise and worship during all that happens today. We absolutely love you. Now join us in praise and worship. Here we go, come on out. Everybody sing. Oh.
everybody. Put your hands together now. Come on.
Shout his name. And 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. Thank you for your goodness that is immeasurable. Thank you for goodness that is immeasurable. Whenever I hear this song, I'm, I'm reminded of my life. I don't know about you, but in my life, I have not been smarter than everybody else. I've not always been in the right place at the right time. And I am here as a result of God's goodness, not my smarts. I believe that there's somebody here who knows that. You want to know it in, a, in like an, ac an acute sense, you know, really pronounced. You want to know that all that you have, all that you are, is because God has been good to you. So that's what it says. I, I did not earn the blessings of God. If we got what we deserve, we wouldn't be here. If we got what we deserve, 
we wouldn't be on our way to heaven. Hallelujah. Let's just offer to the Lord praise and worship and honor. Let's give him everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for those who are seated here in this house, those who are standing, whatever their posture, we thank you for them. We thank you for a life well lived because you instructed them and as a gentle shepherd you are, you carried them in your arms and you held them close to your chest. That's why we are here. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise because you are due that. You are due glory, honor, and praise because there's nobody like you. There's no one who has done for us what you've done. Even those of us who are rebellious and always walking away from you, doing our own thing, and then throwing your name out like it's a talisman, like it's some magic portion. You've been good to those too. We love you for it. We love you for good, being good to our children, our children's children, and sometimes even to the fourth generation. Already in this house, you've been that good, Father. And we acknowledge your goodness. We thank you so very much. Not only for those who are seated here, but for those who are online, who are watching. Some of them, you've delivered them from death. As the psalmist said, there's but one step between me and death. And Lord God, you know that's been our case. It's been all of our case. We didn't know when you delivered us from the head-on collision that we never saw coming. But somehow, it didn't happen. It was, it was you who didn't allow fires to break out or thieves to break in. That was you. You didn't allow the terrorists to blow up our church when they blew up another one. Father God, in the name of the Lord, I thank you and praise you. And from this house, we give you glory because of who you are and what you've done. So I thank you and I ask you now specifically to, as we pray for Jasmine and her children, we ask you to do miraculous and wonderful things for Jazz. Lord God, you've been good to her. And although she has suffered this tragedy in her life almost two years, she says the best time of her life. She never knew you so intimately. Bless her. Cause the, the things to happen to her that you want to happen. And Lord, as her children are being separated from her, in my mind is cold and heartless. But you are able to work all things out for good, even bad things, you work them for good. Things that are undesirable, you work them for good. Things that evil men do, you work them for good, and we thank you for it. We ask you to bless her, cause all these things to happen for the good of the children and for their mom. We pray for Miss Ara, our brother, mom, brother Mark's mom. We ask you, Lord God, to heal her give her strength in her body and Lord even though her fruit is very ripe on the tree we ask that it would not fall to the ground that you would hold it up and you will pluck it when it's time we, feel, we pray, pray again for Ashley that you would heal her of the cancerous tumor we pray for the Hill family and we pray for uh, Jessica De Jesus, we pray for the Hill family that you would strengthen them and give them healing from this COVID-19. Oh God, you're the Lord who heals us. You heal us from sin. You heal us from physical infirmity. You're the great physician, heal the Hill family. And Lord God, we thank you for Jessica that all of the after effects of COVID-19 that you will heal her from those from fatigue from pneumonia and all of the other things the migraine headaches Lord God heal her in the name of Jesus while we are uh, praying as the song goes while on others thou art calling do not pass me by I pray that that would be our cry 
when we see what you have done for others, we know that you are no respecter of persons. You will do it for us. And Lord, I bring you into remembrance of this as I pray for Pastor Bert's mother. You ask, I ask you, Lord God, to heal his mother. Lord God, strengthen his mother. As I said in the office, Lord, I was 58 years old when you took my mom. And I know that I felt like if I was 57, I couldn't have handled it. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's so amazing how you strengthen us. I was 52 years old when you took my dad. And I thought if I were 51 and a half, I couldn't have handled it. But you do it. You know our times. You know when to do what you do. And you don't do it callously. You do it with us in mind. Heal his mother. Strengthen his dad. Heal Brother Luis and, and our sister Susan and Charles and, and, and Nolan. And continue to heal Terry in the name of Jesus. Comfort our sister Margie in the passing of her husband, William. Thank you for Robert and in the passing of his mother and strengthen him and, and Caroline in the name of Jesus. And while you're doing those things, I pray that you would heal this nation. Give us respite from this terrible storm. Rescue your people from their co-opted positions. Cause us to rise and stand and be the people of God that you died for. I pray that we would not be pawns in all of the craziness in the world, but from sea to shining sea, wherever you find a believer, whichever nation we are in, that you would not allow the enemy to control us. Through Jesus Christ, we bless you and give you thanks and praise. Give us respite again from this storm. Let us have a time we can seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to continue our worship now with Sister Jadida is coming to read for us. The Wasted Life. Then he, Jesus, spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In the scriptures cited above, there are more than 20 personal pronouns used by the rich fool or that refer to him. How tragic it is to live life consumed with oneself. God never intended that man should live his life for himself. We should first live toward God and secondly, for the benefit and well-being of others. When a person lives a life that is directed toward God, it is then rightly disposed towards others. Jesus tells us to love God with all our heart mind and soul and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves it is on these two commandments that all the law and prophets depend the person who lives life for himself is bankrupt not only in this life but in eternity as well he who he is one who does not know the real meaning of life. For all he accumulates, he loses. 
For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The losing of the soul is the selfish and stingy person's ultimate loss. That person will have spent his life grasping for the wind and eating his fill only at the end to realize it was a mirage. He was only dreaming. That person who lives in this manner lives a wasted life. In the end, a wasted life benefits no one not even the self-centered self-absorbed person on which it was consumed he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God what does our Heavenly Father value this is the question we should ponder and pursue in what manner is the father rich for the answer to these questions, let us consider these scriptures. Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God's abundant riches of grace are found in Christ. And also in Ephesians 3, 8, the Apostle Paul says again to me who am less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ here we find that God's riches in Christ are unsearchable untraceable they are so numerous and inexhaustible one could never ever track them though he lived 10,000 millennia thirdly in Colossians 1 26 through 27 the Apostle says the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his Saints to them will to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory in the light of God's Word why would one live a wasted life your life is not about you it is an opportunity given to you by God that you might come to know his son Christ Jesus the father's true riches it is apparent that the father has given us the most apparent and starkly revealed roadblocks to a wasted life Jesus Christ and he has simultaneously given us his treasure and roadmap Jesus Christ pastor Don amen I'll tell you what if that didn't get you excited you're not alive come on now Wow thank you Jadita thank you pastor that was excellent let's not live wasted lives huh Let's go out there and do what the Lord wants us to do every minute of every day. Amen? Let's give the Lord another round of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, my name is Jackson Lindsay. I'm the pastor of the youth here at the fellowship. It is so good to see you all. You all look so good. And uh, if you're like me, you're, you're, you're feeling pretty good after a good Christmas season. You had a good Christmas time, hopefully, maybe, not sure. Okay. Some of you are looking like, no, I'm sorry. There's another year coming. Jesus is alive. That's right. Amen. So it doesn't matter if you had a good season or not. You got the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. That's right. That's right. Well, at this time, I'd like to take an a second and have an opportunity to greet those of you that are with us for the very first time. If you are a first-time guest with us this morning, if you could please wave your hand in the air like you just don't care. Put it up there. Don't be scared. Anybody in here with us for the very first time? Wave at me. I can't see you if you are waving. 
nice and high. Don't be afraid. Hey, all right. Yes, sir. Excellent. Good to see y'all. Thank you so much for hanging in there. Right now, our ushers are bringing you an information card. If you could please fill that out. It's just got basic information on there. Uh, you know, your name, social security number, bank account information, favorite food, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you could fill that out, uh, we have some people that would love to reach out and talk to with you. We have a free gift for you as well. And uh, Scott, we've also got one more person right up here up front. You got him as well? Okay, thank you. Um, at this second, let's go ahead and take an opportunity to say hi to each other. If you could please stand to your feet, turn around, wave at somebody, tell them hi, say hello. All right, have a seat. That's enough of that. We have many things that are going on here at the fellowship, but one of the things I really want to make you aware of is that this Thursday we will be having our midweek service, not on Wednesday, but Thursday because we will be celebrating the new year. So that is Thursday. Everybody say Thursday. Thursday. Say 7 o'clock. Say to 9 p.m. That'll be our New Year's service, okay? So make sure that you attend that this Thursday from 7 to 9. Um, I have a couple of other announcements I'd like to say and share. Uh, today, this person, this man of God, would like to wish his wonderful wife, Carmen, a happy 43rd wedding anniversary. He says that he would like to thank the Lord for blessing him with a Proverbs 31 woman. Somebody was, I was talking with somebody about that, and I said, man, you know, that's, that's amazing that the Lord gave, you know, a whole chapter talking about the amazing woman, and they said, yeah, and the Lord gave the first 30 chapters to tell the men how to treat that Proverbs 31 woman correctly. So, ooh, okay. He says that he also wants to thank his Lord for her and that she never gave up on him and that the Lord and her are the reason that he is here today. So we want to wish y'all both a very happy 43rd wedding anniversary. We'd also like to wish Michael Lavelle a very happy birthday today as well. Happy birthday, Michael. You know, we were uh, at the Christmas service, the Christmas Eve service, we were standing around and uh, talking about years of the fellowship, both Michael and myself have grown up here, and we were just talking about like all of the years and the things that we remember, and it really has been an amazing time. So happy birthday to you, man, and many more, all right? Amen, yes. I'd also like to welcome Curtis and Erica Shaw. Thank you so much for being here. Go ahead, stand up, and let's let all of us see y'all. Yeah. All right, you can sit down. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. And also, Philip Johnson. Go ahead and stand up and show off those suspenders and bow tie and all of it. Yeah, man. Looking good. All right. Well, just wanted to, we're a full service church here. We not only preach the word, we have great praise and worship, we pray, but we also like to acknowledge the things in life that are important. So thank you so much for bearing with us. At this time, we're now going to move into our offering to our time of giving. So ushers, please get in place. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say before we received the offering that uh, we did just experience a wonderful Christmas season. We had a great Christmas Eve service, uh, but that giving to the Lord those things that we can is very, very important. You might think that this offering time is just some sort of checkbox or like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. But this really, truly is worship, giving back to the Lord, saying, thank you so much for all that you've given me. I want to offer this worship to you, this sacrificial giving in some situations. Some people that give are giving in faith, knowing that they need that money more than they feel the church does, and they're still giving anyways because they love the Lord. So I just want to always re us to remember that, that our offering is a form of worship, and we are saying that we love the Lord. So let's go ahead and, uh, well, let me tell you real quick how you can give. We have three ways to give here at the fellowship. You can give here in person. Uh, if you're giving by check, you don't need an envelope, but if you're giving by cash and you would like an envelope, you can just raise your hand, and our ushers will be quick to give you an envelope. Um, if, you can, if you want, you can also give online at cccfellowship.com forward slash give, uh, or you can text your gift to 361 Three eight six two five six five. Again, that's three six one, three eight six two five six five six five. Sorry, you can text the word keywords, and it'll give you all of the different giving options that are available to you. 
All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning and for this time. Lord, you are so good. We are so thankful for all that you've done for us. We're so thankful that you sent Jesus Christ to this earth for us. This life that we live, Lord, we live to bring you glory, to bring you honor, to serve you. No matter what we do, Lord, we just want to be a good and faithful servant when it's all said and done. Help us to do that. Lord, I ask that you would bless the gift this morning as well as the giver. And we ask that it would go and accomplish your will here on this earth. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Amy. Uh, bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and the praise and worship has been wonderful, and um, Amy's special playing is just great. And uh, the reading was awesome. And um, uh, Pastor Jackson's facilitating was just spot on. You know, wow. Let me tell you, uh, uh, also, we have uh, something, uh, our sister Karen Durrell uh, was voted uh, by her peers the Teacher of the Year. Where are you, Karen? Oh, yeah. Teacher of the Year. Man, that's really big. That's big stuff. I want you to know, Karen, it's not like y'all voting me the best senior pastor of the church. <laughs> not, not the same. <laughs> that was big. Anyway, I, I knew she was smart when a number of years ago, many years ago, uh, uh, before she went back and, and went to school and got all those degrees and advanced things. And uh, I remember going in there. I had written something, and she looked at me, got a little pen, and said, it corrected my grammar. Uh, it, really, it really put a dent in my soul. But I recognized, I said, I think she's pretty smart. I always had a problem with that I and me. And that sit and sat. But anyway, thank you so much. I'm, we're grateful to the Lord for you. 
and uh, your family. Amen. Amen. So, um, I want to tell you a little story before I, I start my message today. Uh, my message is entitled, The Story Continues. The story, we've been, we've been talking about the Christmas story, so the story continues. Uh, I want to tell you a story that I've told you before. I heard this pastor uh, from Mississippi tell a story about uh, when he was a little boy, how his mother would take him um, to the, the corner. He, he, the school wasn't far from his house. And so she would take him to this corner of this busy street, and she would say to him, Rodney, I want you, when you go to school in the morning, I want you to come here, you know, to this stop, this corner. I want you to look to the left and look to the right. And if you don't see any cars, cross the street. And so she, every day she would say, Rodney, I want you to come to this corner and look to the left and look to the right. If you don't see any cars, cross the street. She did, did that so many times. So Rodney said, one day he said, I know, I know, I know, Mom. If, I, if I, I come to the corner and I look to the left, I look to the right, if I don't see any cars, I can cross the street. I know. She said, okay, now you got it. What she wanted to do was make sure he had it. And so she kept repeating because, uh, because it was very possible for him to have uh, a, a fatality there or an accident. Some ca he could not look and cross the street and whammo, you know, and uh, he was gone. So his mom wanted to make sure, so she kept repeating her instructions and kept repeating them until he had them internalized. And so today is sort of like that. I want to repeat the Christmas story to you because you must internalize this story because the story continues. When some, sometimes we read and we think, well, that was it. Let me go to the next thing. No, that Christmas story is continuing, and you are all playing a part in it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. In, in every season of life, it is important for God's people to know that his promises are certain and sure and that he always keeps his word. You must know this in every season of your life, that God's promises are sure, they're certain, and he always keeps his word. It doesn't matter about the passage of time. He keeps his word. Amen. Hallelujah. In the story that we're, we're about to share with you, um, the promise became a reality. Now, you may say, like some of us, well, when God said it, it was a reality. Yes, for, for God. But for us, it was not. It was something afar off. But when it comes to pass, it becomes your reality. In our Christmas story, we had two babies who were born under miraculous circumstances a woman who was past childbearing age and an old man whose natural function seemed to be a thing of the past or fading quickly. They somehow uh, looked at, uh, Zacharias looked at this thing, uh, the fact uh, that his wife was well advanced in years and that his uh, bodily functions were getting pretty old or already gone. And uh, so in looking at that, he mustered the strength, the courage to say to uh, the angelic announcement, we're old folks. How can this be? We're old. He, they, he looked at natural circumstances. But suddenly, they were expecting a child. When he went back home sometime thereafter, a short while, obviously, they were expecting a child for the first time in their old age, in their supposedly unfruitful years. Now God is speaking to somebody because sometimes when we start to get old and we have aches that we never had, pains in places that we hardly knew exist. We think that now it's too late for God, but it's not too late for God you're here and you are living and breathing. And so the words that the angel was speaking were not his own. And it wasn't just that he was a, 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 some extraterrestrial just talking about stuff, but he was the angel Gabriel, a messenger of God. And uh, the, the Almighty God had given him a message for this, this man who had been faithful, had been very devout, and his wife had been the same. Sometimes we think that all that we're doing is, goes unnoticed. 
You know, I imagine some of you in this uh, congregation, those of you online have said, uh, all I do is uh, it goes unnoticed. Nobody cares. Nobody notices. That's not the truth. God sees. He will not forget your labor. He will not forget the love that you've shown to, to people. That's who God is. So uh, the scripture says that, that uh, those were God's words when he told Gabriel to go down here and tell Zacharias that, uh, uh, that his prayers have been heard and that he and Elizabeth are going to have a child. And uh, he, he, God didn't forget, but he didn't tell Gabriel, now he's going to doubt you. How many of us doubt God? God's words will always come to pass. God's words will always come to pass. Not sometimes, not most of the time. They will always come to pass. The scripture says now it was in the sixth month uh, in, uh, into an impossible pregnancy. It was the sixth month into an impossible pregnancy. God was performing another miracle of in Nazareth. Uh, he was going to do something that had never been done before. And I don't believe this is just the historicity of of things. I believe this is, yes, history, but it's also informing us of something that God still is doing and still wants to do in your life. Amen. Don't be like Zacharias and have God have to touch your mouth and, and, and cause you to be unable to speak or give you some, some problem to get your mind off your doubt, your fear and unbelief. Amen. That's what Zacharias needed. So the angel said, okay, you're looking for a sign. This is your sign. You won't be able to talk doubt anymore until this happens. And so, but at the same time God was doing that in the sixth month, God sent Gabriel to perform another miracle. Uh, he was, he's, he's prophesied to this young girl named Mary, a virgin girl, that she would have a child. And, uh, this virgin girl said, that's not possible in a sense. She said, how can this be? Since I am a virgin, I don't know a man. How can this be? He said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And so at the same time, there was one miracle being uh, performed over, over uh, near, in the hills of Judea, where Zacharias and Elizabeth were. There was another one in Nazareth, a place that it was said, can any good thing come out of there? And, and so God was doing something in an unlikely place. I like to say that my life is an unlikely life, and my situation is an unlikely situation, but God looked and had mercy upon, upon my mom and my dad and, and, and me, obviously, and he said something and he did something. But you may look and say, well, I'm not unlikely. Yes, you are. You are because you're, you're, you're born of a woman. Yeah, you're born under sin. Yes, you are somebody that God wants to perform a miracle through. Amen. 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 God was speaking life into this young girl named Mary, and, and a virgin was going to have a child without human aid. Uh, a virgin would be the mother of her own child. How is that possible? A virgin is the mother of her own child. And, it's, and, and in this story... Um, these two promises, one to an, an, an elderly couple and one to a young teenage virgin girl, these two promises became two babies. And these two babies became two young boys. And these two young boys became two men who would change the world forever. One of the boys was a forerunner to God's Messiah to the Messiah, God in human flesh. Can you imagine that? This happened in the earth. This happened, as it were, to uh, somebody's neighbor. Yeah, somebody that we thought was just like everybody else, but God was doing something special in their life, in their home. God is doing that right now for us. He is doing something special for you, and he's thinking of good things to bring about on your behalf. When you think all hope is lost, God is bringing H-O-P-E into your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the young boys, he had a short life, 
in that he was about, the forerunner was about 31 or 32, and Zap, Herod takes his head, he dies. The other uh, forerunner, yes, uh, uh, died uh, on a cross, a cruel, rugged cross, at a, approximately the age of 80, uh, 70, uh, 33 years, 33, I'm 70 something. <laughs> Zacharias is probably 80 something, but Jesus was only 33. Jesus, being about 33 years old, died on a cruel cross for us. And so, but his life didn't end there. He died, went into the grave, came out again. And Jesus, that other young boy, unlikely, born to a virgin, is now seated on the throne of God. He is ruling everything, visible and invisible. That's what God is able to do in your life. The story continues, everybody. The story continues. It's not the end of the story. And there will never be an end of the story because the angel said uh, 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 of his government, of his peace, there will be no end. Or rather, Scripture says there will be no end. There will be no end to his rule. There will be no end. And what that is saying is to all of us who have faith, there will be no end. God has done something miraculous already in your life. Now, now let's recount this story. I told you that about Pastor Rodney because I wanted you to know that I'm going to repeat a lot of things. But I want to do it because uh, we need to re recount and re-examine because your faith depends on this story. You, you may say, my faith, no, your faith depends on you believing this story. Because if you don't believe this story, you don't believe that Jesus came. You don't believe that Jesus is a real person. You don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. He says, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. He is the only way you're ever going to know God. He's the only way you're going to live forever. I didn't mean exist forever. The only way you're going to live forever. Hallelujah. But what the angel had told Zacharias about John it was amazing. And I want to just, just go here just for a moment. Um, I, I feel like the Lord is calling me to some things that I never saw myself as doing. I always just wanted to be a, your pastor and, and love you and give you my life. And, and, and consequently, I, then I bring my wife and give you my wife's life. We, we give our lives to you. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. I, I did not know that all, a lot of these other things uh, would, would happen. But this is what I, let me go back to my story quickly before my time runs out. The, the Lord knows, he knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He, 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 he He's an amazing God who adds a lot of color and excitement to our human story. This is what he says about, um, about uh, the boy John uh, being born. And, and, and my, my point in bringing this out is just to visit this for a moment, is that John was named before he was in the womb. And in the womb, he had a name. And Jesus was named before he was in the womb. And in the womb, he had a name. And, and I said this one day, and I don't know if it was coincidence, but I said this a few couple of weeks ago, that the name wasn't Thetis, it was John. The name wasn't Thetis, it was Jesus. And, and, I, and, and when I said that, I don't know if it was coincidental, but it was the wrong time. A couple just jumped up and walked out. And I, I thought, did I offend somebody? I think that maybe God has called on us, men and women of God, preachers and, and teachers of the Word of God, to sometimes offend wrong. We ought to say something that wrong knows it's wrong. May I just say that to you? And uh, I'm not called to be politically correct. I'm called to be a man of God, called to be a voice from God. And this is what we all ought to endeavor to do. I'm not trying to compromise so somebody will like me. I'm trying to live so God can use me. Amen. This is what, what, what the angel said. You will have joy and gladness at his birth. Many will rejoice. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now notice what he says. He will be great where? In the sight of the Lord. John the Baptist was great in the sight of the Lord. Not in the sight of men necessarily, but in the sight of the Lord. But we are spending too much time wanting to be great in the sight of men and wanting to be liked by men. That's how we are. And we can find all kinds of excuses for political correctness. Well, I'm not trying to be that way. You know, you know remember, remember when we were younger, we saw old people like maybe as old as I am. I'm not old yet, but, but uh, I'm getting there very fast. 
you know, because to me, 80, uh, 80 something is old. 89, 80, you know, I almost said 80, 10, but 90, <laughs> 90, 95, you know, that's getting old. But anyway, anyway, uh, we used to see them, and they would just say whatever they wanted to say. You know any, any old person like that? No? I, oh, okay, a few of you. Some of you guys say, I don't know anybody like that. I guess they're the old people. But, but they would just say whatever they wanted to say. And uh, I feel like th that's not necessarily age dictating that. It could very well be that we have lived long enough to know that what God says is what needs to be said. Amen. But John the Baptist, he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. That means he's dedicated to the Lord. That's what this scripture means. He was a, a Nazarene. He had a, a Nazarite vow. That he, and that was a sign that he was dedicated to the Lord. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Another miracle of John. You and I were not filled with the Holy Spirit from our mother's womb, but we have now been filled with the Holy Spirit because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We are now filled with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we should walk differently. We should talk differently. The scripture says that John would turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And what it shows me that there, there are... Uh, there is rather here a backslidden condition for Israel and there is a backslidden condition for many uh, of us and I've started calling us churchgoers. There are a backslidden condition. John turned those people uh, back to the Lord their God and I think it is up to us not to try to placate everybody and try to pacify everybody, but we ought to live our lives turning folks back to the Lord, not to some worldly position. Somebody ought to say amen if you believe the word of God. He says also, he will go also go before him, before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's, he's going to go in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so the prophet Elijah, what did he do? To turn the hearts in the, of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And so our, our responsibility as people who are filled with the Holy Spirit should be to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. We should bring God's viewpoint, God's righteousness, God's will, God's desire to the earth. Not our own. We should bring Godness. We should bring Christ-likeness to, to any sphere we find ourselves. Come on, somebody. That's what we should do. And those who seem to have strayed, those who are, are disobedient among us, let's don't make further enemies out of them. Let's don't internet them. You know, the Internet, though, has exposed more crookedness and craziness than anything I've seen. I mean, if you're, if you're messed up and you stay on the Internet, everybody's going to know you've messed up. And so don't get mad at them, but, but that's not your job. Your, your job is not to leave them there. Your job is not to ridicule them there. It is to, t uh, to, to uh, turn the, di the disobedient to the wisdom of those who are justified, those who are just, those who are righteous in God. He says, Why? He says, because the spirit of Elijah is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You can't get ready. Somebody said, well, the Lord's coming to redeem us. I like it better. The Lord is coming for the redeemed. You know, rather than he's going to come and then everything's going to be suddenly all right. That's not really the way this thing works. A lot of us call on God. We call on God. Oh, God, every time we're in trouble, like he's some talisman or some magic potion. We don't call on God. But our responsibility as this particular generation could very well be a forerunner generation. And specifically, there may be somebody here who is a specifically a forerunner to Jesus. But as a collective, we all are in a sense of that. Wow. Wow. And we need to turn people to the wisdom of the just. We need to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Prepared having to do with being dealt beforehand. It's like the little paring knife that we would use to, to cut the potato or the, or the apple. The little paring knife to peel that. Then we are prepared beforehand. You must be prepared beforehand. I would like to say again to all the church people listening, even you online, we must be prepared beforehand. If you're not living right and living well, you need to be prepared. You need to take this as an opportunity because the story continues. This is that Elijah that James wrote about from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. In Malachi 3, 1, 
He says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So what, what the Lord God is saying is, I'm going to send somebody to prepare the way. Because when, when the king comes, uh, everything needs to be, uh, the carpet needs to be rolled out, as it were, for the king. Uh, it needs to be rolled out. And so we're going to see what that looks like in just a moment. Um, when I was a, a, a young boy, my mom said something, uh, uh, well, I was a young man. And my mom said that when she was carrying me in her womb, she was carrying me in her womb, that she was at her height in the, in the Lord. She said it, it was like that was a, a glorious period of, of her life and her relationship with the Lord. She had been seeking him, seeking him, and he just really was on her in a powerful way. And I, I, I like to think, I'd like to think that that's why as a young child, a little child, I was a God seeker. I'm not saying I was always right. Don't, don't think that. No little child is going to always be right. No teenager is going to always be right. And some adults aren't, aren't always right. But don't give up on them. Don't, don't give up on them. You, you still hold out for God's truth in their life. And so uh, James says this about Elijah. Elijah was a man, and it's James 5, 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly. But before I get to pray earnestly, he was a man with a nature like ours. I like to say to you, uh, I am very ordinary. I am like you are. If you've ever had a mean thought, I probably had it too. Now, if you had murder, I'm mad at that one. But, but I mean, oh, oh, when I, oh, when I'm musing and I'm Liam Neeson, I may have done some of that. <laughs> but, but I'm a person like you are. If you had doubts and fears, I've had doubts and fears. Uh, if you felt like giving up, I felt like giving up. And so Elijah was a man of like passion, uh, with a nature like ours. Now listen, but what he did, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Wow. Elijah was like you. But, but Elijah, the Holy Spirit had come upon Elijah. And, and John came in the spirit of Elijah. And, and what it means is that John's words meant something to God. And it means that your words mean something to God. So don't just throw your words around everywhere. But also, e Elijah, um, in, in the Old Testament, Elijah was not the kind of person like 20, 21st century believers. Uh, we, we just adore uh, our leaders, our politicians, and we're always trying to curry favor with them. I, I see it everywhere I go, just currying favor, currying favor. But that's not what this man of God, this prophet did, Ahab. And, and that's not what John the Baptist did. Ahab, listen to what he did. He's called the Tishbite in 1 Kings 17, 1. 1 Kings 17, 1. He's called Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab. Now, he went to the king. This is Ahab. Ahab is married to Jezebel. Jezebel is a bad woman. I mean, when Ahab wanted a vineyard that didn't belong to him, Naboth's vineyard, uh, she said, baby, what are, you, what are you over there saying about? Well, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. Talking about it belongs to his grand, his daddy and his granddaddy and his great grand won't give it to me. She said, Don't worry about that. I deal with him. I just kill him. I mean, she was a bad girl. Now listen, you got a wife who protects you like that? And I mean that's that's something. And then you, here you are, the prophet. And you go up there and you tell him this. That's what, hey, Elijah, that's the spirit of Elijah. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. When have you seen a pastor do that to any leader? I'm just saying to us, I'm not saying being cantankerous, I'm saying being the voice of God. This is the spirit and power of, uh, uh, of, of Elijah. Listen to what John the Baptist does. John the Baptist is, walks in that spirit. Here is Herod. Herod now has taken his brother's wife. He's now got her in his palace. She's his now. His brother Philip. And uh, what, did, what did, did John do? Herod! 
It is not right for you to have your brother's wife. Where have you ever heard a pastor do that? Those who have access, I, I'm talking to you. I feel like going on one of those Pentecostal fits for a minute. No, no, no. I'm talking about go ahead. When I do, you're going to be talking about me all over lunch. <laughs> so, so, so are, you, are you getting the picture? What I'm saying is God didn't call us to compromise. He called us to bring change. It's not popular, but we must bring change. Someone has to see these promises and take hold of these promises. And I believe that we are the generation that can see them. And what we see, we can have. What we see we can have. Uh, Elijah told Elisha that if you see me when I'm taken up, you can have what you want. You can have a double portion. Amen. We ought to be a double portion generation. And the, because the Bible says that when he was taken up, Elisha saw him. He saw the chariot and the horsemen. And he was shouting, my father. And suddenly the mantle drops and he picks it up. And he goes to the Jordan. Where's the God of Elijah? And swash, a miracle happened. The Jordan split open. Where is the God of Elijah? That's the question. The story continues. Does God want to show himself through you? You say, well, I'm unlikely. So was John. Come here, this guy didn't know what to eat. Locusts and honey? You know? Wearing strange clothes, but he was great in the sight of the Lord. He was great in the sight of the Lord. He was great in the sight of the Lord. Somebody must make an announcement that John was the herald. Before his birth, he was declared a herald. Jacob was spoken of before he was born. Jeremiah before he was in the womb. Paul in the womb was separated unto God. I'm saying the womb is an important place. God's doing great things in the womb. We're going to talk more on that subject in the future. I think it's time for the church to stop being so political about these things and be righteous about it. I said to somebody who tried to get me to do some uh, placard waving and, 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 and being very venomous against young girls and, and, and women who were having abortions. I said, I won't do that, but I'll do a fast with you. We'll go out there and we'll, we'll have a fast and prayer vigil. They didn't want to do that. All right, let me move on. This is what he says. This is what God was going to do. He was going to save Israel from her enemies and the hand of those that hated her. So he was going to perform the mercy promised to the Father and to remember his covenant, to grant that we, the, the Jewish people, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness, in piety, in righteousness, in justice, before him all the days of their lives. That's what he said. This is what God's purpose was, to do these things. These things haven't been totally fulfilled yet. Why haven't they been totally fulfilled yet? Because they are, are going to be fulfilled in perhaps our day right now. Perhaps this is that day before the coming of the Lord. John the Baptist, he says, will be called a prophet of the highest. He's going to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by remission of their sins. What about us? What is our job? We're to guide those in the way of peace. We're to give those light who are sitting in darkness, as John did. He's, he was also the voice of one crying in the wilderness. True prophets were voices. Their messages were from God. And I believe it's the same today. It's not a prophet. We don't go uh, or wherever we go on the Internet or any place else and prophesy lie because we want something to happen. That's not. And some of us are following those. I said some of us are following those people. But John in Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So God needs some people who will cry in the wilderness, the waste places, those places where the, the people don't want to go, where it's not so popular to be. John was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In desert places, in places that people don't want to be, that's where we ought to find ourselves. 
make, a de make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Then he goes on to use such colorful language. He says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And this is what John is saying. He's saying before the coming of the Lord, there must be great revival before the day of the Lord. Before we see a lot of negative things in the world, there must be revival. And there will never be revival as long as we love cushy jobs, cushy places, as long as we want to be loved by the, the, uh, the opposition, as long as we just want our rights. We won't see the revival. John was like a wild man. And this is what the scripture says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does anybody have a revelation? Does anyone have a revelation in this dreadful time in which we live? Does anybody know anything to say? Does anybody have a word from the Lord? Has the Lord pricked any heart? The Bible says that for, for without faith it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. Are there any diligent seekers in the house? Are there any diligent seekers online? The scripture says, you will seek me and you will find me. You will seek me and find me. I've read that scripture all of my life. But he says, but you will do it. Seek me, find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Are there anybody here who is ready to, and, and willing to risk a heart attack for God? We want to get out of life alive. But he says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For when you come to God, you must believe that God is. He exists. And that he exists to bless you. That's the spirit of Elijah. That's the spirit of John the Baptist. He wasn't trying to curry favor. He wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. He was seeking God. I want to say it again. It may not sound good, but I want to say it anyway. From my childhood, I was in the third grade when I first fasted. I never thought I'd have a life like that. I just wanted to do it as a little boy. I don't know why I wanted to do it. I just wanted to. Cried and begged and pleaded. Cried and begged. And I, I knew how to cry. Nothing like I do today. I fell on the floor in those days. And I could kick while I was lying down. I don't know how, but I cried and, and acted such a, a little nut. Mom said, okay, 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 you can fast. One day, I fasted that day. Diligent seeker. I never wanted to be more than a one, two, or three, four-day fast. But I'm a diligent seeker. And I say this because I am convinced we've not diligently sought him. I'm convinced of it. You can't convince me otherwise. Do we want these things to happen? Do we want to be free from our enemies and those who hate us, blowing up churches because you don't like somebody worshiping the true living God, trying to kill people who call on the name Jesus, or trying to correct us, you can pray, but don't call on that name of the Nazarene. I, I am diligently seeking him. I am diligently seeking him. I want you to diligently seek him because the Bible says... He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Church, he's going to reward you. He says, you will seek me and you'll find me. I can't get off those scriptures. You will seek me and you will find me. A number of years ago, and I'm going to take my seat a second. I said to Brother Charles, I said, Charles, the disciples knew something we don't know. I said, because they did what we have never done. And I'm going to find out. And God, let me find out. It was Christ-centeredness. They had an, an understanding of Jesus like no, no other 
uh, previous generation had even in prophecy. They understood Christ. They handled God. And I'm going to find out about this diligent seeking. Whatever it costs me, I'm going to find out. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm going to find out. It doesn't matter. Food is not important. I'm going to find out. Because he says, you'll seek me and you'll find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found of you. And I'm going to know on this side of heaven what it's like to walk hand in hand with God like never before. And this is available to all of us if, in fact, we're the forerunner generation. I'll be back in a minute. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and the darkest night. You are close like no other. I know you as a song your testimony yes let me tell you I, I'm, I'm so happy and excited to be with you today God is so good and when I say these things I'm not saying them boasting but I'm gonna find out I'm gonna find out God rewarding the diligent seeker and I'm gonna seek him I'm gonna seek him and if, and if, and if they lay me down and I'm stretched out I'm still seeking all right, I'm still seeking. God is good. And I want us to be people who are hard after God from the womb to the tomb. We're going to be concerned about life from the 
womb to the tomb. We're going to be concerned about life from the womb to the tomb. Is that all right? Come on. I want some fellow travelers. I want some fellow travelers. I went over time a little bit, but I'm not apologizing for it. You can tell those at the door, they can just wait in the coffee cafe just another minute. But I thank you so much for your time. And uh, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. I love you. We love you. And let's y yield ourselves to the Lord fully all throughout our lives. Let's uh, yield ourselves fully to the Lord, giving him everything. Let's give him everything. Amen? Super. Super. Well, it's time to go. And uh, not just as a little thumbtack, but if you've heard the message today and you don't know Jesus, whether you're online or here in the sanctuary, you can come to Jesus. You don't need a long ceremony to come to Jesus. You, one of my dear friends said he came to, the Jesus, to Jesus by, he had gone to church because he was trying to court a girl there, and she was very devout. And uh, the pastor asked him to come to the Lord. He just he said, well, raise your hand. He raised his hand. That's all he did. He's one of, one of the greatest preachers in the world today. You know, so you can come to Jesus by repenting of your sins, accepting him into your heart. And that's how you do it. You just confess your sins. Tell, tell God you're sorry and mean it and ask him to save you. He'll do it. Well, great. Well, let us bless the Lord. But before we do, um, Children's Church. So those who are going, who have children in children's church, um, you can slip out and go through those double doors there and get your, your children. And the rest of you, I, don't you go through the double doors and get an early exit. You go out that hallway, I mean that uh, wall, the back way, and then go out where you see Brother Andrew. Oh, Brother Andrew, uh, they changed positions. Brother Charles, Brother Charles and his trusted companion, Andrew, and then over here, Andrew's mom, Sister Elsa, uh, those of us who are here are going to go out that door. Let's bless the Lord. Repeat after me, please. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name. I bless you. Go with God. Amen.